thank you for being here, whether you're <laughs> in person or online, which is kind of a joke because everybody's online as I'm recording this ahead of time. Uh, but uh, again, thank you for being here and appreciate your interest in this study of the book of Acts. We're ready for Acts 13, which is the beginning of what we call Paul's first missionary journey. Let me read the first four verses of Acts 13. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manahem, member of the court of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for the, me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I will send them. And then, and, and after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. First missionary journey, Barnabas and Saul, note the order there, it'll change a little bit later, uh, start the first missionary journey from Antioch. And they're chosen by prophets at Antioch. A prophet was a person who had the ability to speak for God and who had revealed things from God to be able to tell the people. And uh, they were uh, uh, Barnabas, whom we're familiar with, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, and Manahem, who interestingly was a member of the court of Herod the Tishark, and uh, according to history had been brought up with him and was sort of a foster brother. And then there was Saul. They were sent out by Antioch Church, chapter 13, verse 3, and by the Holy Spirit, chapter 13, verse 4. We mentioned before, but the word apostle was a word in general use which meant somebody sent with a commission, that is, sent with a particular job to do, and then sent by somebody. So in this case, Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas and Saul, were uh, apostles of the Antioch Church and of the Holy Spirit. Uh, if you want to find out what the, the apostles who had all of the special power is concerned, they were apostles of Christ. You could be an apostle of anybody if you were sent by them and encouraged by them uh, to do a particular work. And then chapters 4 through 12, I mean verses 4 through 12 of, uh, of Acts. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia and from there sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews. And they had John, that's John Mark, to assist them. And when they had given, gone throughout the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain um, magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. I want to stop there just a minute to explain a little bit about geography. If you're familiar at all with looking at the uh, map or, or picture of the Mediterranean Sea, you know that over on the uh, uh, west side, there is a fairly large island, and it's called Cyprus. And uh, uh, it has a city on the western end called Salamis, and one on the eastern end called Paphos. And so when Paul and Silas preached in both those places, they had basically uh, preached across the whole, the whole island. And then they found this Jewish false prophet or magician named Bar-Jesus. Verse 7, he was, a, he was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus. So the proconsul was the person sent by the Romans to be the sort of uh, acting governor of the, uh, uh, of the island. And, and he, Sergius Paulus was a man of intelligence who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elimus the magician, or that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also called Paul, and from this time on we'll see that he uses Paul instead of Saul, filled with the Holy Spirit, 
looked intently at him and said, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, you full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop me making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. And immediately mist and darkness fell upon him and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed. Uh, we've talked many times before about the uh, uh, miracles being uh, for the purpose of confirming the word. And that worked here. Uh, the proconsul saw what had happened to um, Elimus as he was opposing the gospel, and therefore that confirmed for him the gospel. And uh, when he saw what he was heard, he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. And then uh, this John Mark that we mentioned is with us uh, on this journey at this point, and uh, uh, he is a cousin of Bar Barnabas, we're told. Uh, chapter 13, four, verse 13 and 14 of chapter 13 uh, uh, says that uh, they sailed from Paphos to Perga. That's getting back up on the mainland in the southern part of what we today call Perga, or call Asia, Turkey. And John Mark has left them. There was no explanation for that. He just didn't go with them the rest of the way. Uh, Barnabas and Saul, now it's Paul and Barnabas, uh, did not preach at Perga on that occasion but did on the return trip, chapter 14, verse 25. Uh, Antioch of Pisidia is a place in uh, Galatia, in the southern part of, uh, uh, of Asia Minor, uh, and there was a synagogue there. You have to keep in mind, keep separate in your mind, Antioch of Pisidia over in, uh, over, we'd say over in Turkey today, it's over in uh, Asia Minor now, and Antioch of Syria, which was the place where uh, Paul and Barnabas were sent from. Uh, they went to the synagogue in, cooperation, in, in uh, uh, consideration of Paul's mission where he preaches to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. And then we're told there were devoted men and women there who were around the synagogue. Uh, I, I received a comment on this. I, I, I welcome you to send me questions or comments, and I'll make use of them. In this case, I received a comment saying that I perhaps uh, didn't pl explain fully uh, what these uh, uh, devout people were. Uh, in this context, when it's talking about people hearing the gospel in the synagogue and being converted and they're devout people, in every instance there, in that context, they are Gentiles who sort of were hangers on at the synagogue because they appreciated the monogamy of the God that, they was, that was preached there and the high morality in contrast to the immorality of the Greek uh, gods. Uh, on the other hand, devout is like apostles is a word in general usage. And uh, uh, in, for example, in Acts 2, the Bible says that uh, when the Jews were coming to Pentecost, uh, there were devout men from every nation under heaven. These were Jews from many different places come together for the for Pentecost. So I say the devout men and women are, are Gentiles uh, who are hangers on at the synagogue. That only applies if you're in the context of Paul preaching at synagogue. Paul was visiting rabbi and therefore he was invited to preach. Paul's sermon, according to he, is referred to as a word of exhortation. Uh, that seems to be their, their term for, uh, for a sermon. And interestingly, in uh, Hebrews 13 and verse 22, uh, uh, Hebrews is referred to as a word of exhortation. That's appropriate uh, because Hebrews is more like a sermon than an epistle. Uh, it's, uh, it doesn't have the marks of an epistle. It doesn't start out with uh, a sort of a dear uh, 
in our English uh, English way of looking, it didn't start with dear so and so and end sincerely, Paul. Uh, it had it didn't have the marks of an epistle in those days. It was more like a sermon, and so it was a word of exhortation, as a scripture calls it. Uh, then there's a sermon that Peter preached on that occasion, uh, verses 16 to 47. Uh, the sermon that he preached, if you're familiar with and remembering Peter's sermon on Pentecost and this one, were very similar. Uh, it goes the history of Israel from Moses to the promise to, to David that the Messiah would come through him. And then it refers to the message of John the Baptist that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then it refers to the life and crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus who went about doing good. And then he quotes from the second Psalm, chapter 2, verse 7, this is my, uh, this is my beloved son. Uh, and then in Psalm 1610, uh, he mentions the resurrection being... Uh, uh, prophesied in that psalm. You will not, uh, speaking of David, you will not allow my uh, soul to remain in Hades, nor my body to see corruption. Uh, that uh, uh, was a promise of resurrection, and it sounded like it was speaking of David, but Peter here, by inspiration, applies it to, uh, to Jesus. Uh, then he gave an appeal and a warning for those who would not receive the gospel and appeal to those who would come and receive the gospel. And then in chapter, verses 46 to 52, uh, the result of the sermon is recorded. The whole city was interested. Uh, unbelieving Jews, though, drove Paul and Barnabas out of the city. They were jealous because the sermon, the, the sermon was so well received and no doubt received not only by the Jews, but also by the devout people, the uh, uh, Gentiles who were around the synagogue at that time uh, as well. So they uh, drove Barnabas and Paul out, out of the city. Uh, Acts 13, 46 to 47 says, and Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord commanded us, saying, I have made you a light to the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Uh, interesting comment you have judged yourselves unworthy of eternal life uh, by not receiving the gospel. That same thing could be said of many, many people today who hear and reject uh, what God has done for, uh, for all of us. Uh, then verse 48, uh, when the Gentiles heard this, they began to rejoice and glorifying the word of the Lord and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. That verse is sometimes used for, uh, uh, to support Calvinism, the idea of, of election, but the lexicons, that's the dictionaries and the commentaries, uh, use a different term. Appointed to eternal life can be disposed to eternal life, uh, having the uh, desire, sort of leaning toward eternal life. Uh, it, it's in, in, in God's translation, he uses the term uh, disposed to eternal life. And that is a correct term according to the lexicons or dictionaries that are still available uh, to us. That brings up the idea of the parable of the sower. Uh, there are f four different kinds of soil. And only one of the kinds of soil was ready to receive the gospel and, and bear fruit. It, it reminds us of the first of the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for uh, they shall see God. The poor in spirit are those who recognize their own sin, realize there's nothing they can do about their sin, and therefore turn to the Lord to uh, have it taken care of. And again in Acts 18.1, for I am with you 
this is God speaking to Paul, and no one will attack you to harm, for I have many in this city who are my people. That's talking about people who were, to use uh, uh, Accord's idea, who were disposed to the gospel, who were poor in spirit and ready, therefore, to receive uh, the gospel. And, uh, uh, and as a result of that, uh, the word of the Lord uh, was spreading throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. The Gentiles were delighted, the Jews were angry. The devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city, these were sided with the Jews. Let me mention a fellow by the name of Sir William Ramsey. Uh, he is a very uh, significant, uh, uh, not, not inspired, much later, uh, student of, of this whole area. Uh, he was not a Christian at one time. Uh, he was simply a, a, a historian who majored in uh, the second and third century. Modernists who followed an evolutionary scheme uh, believed that uh, uh, things were started in primitive fashion and, and, and grew and become uh, more mature later. Uh, had, had, cited that, had decided that the Book of Acts was published in and written in the second and third century. And uh, consequently, Ramsey, who was a student of that area, of that era, uh, began to study it. And what he found was that it did not fit that second and third century. That Luke's account of the things that were going on, uh, and, and the, uh, one of the highlights was the name of the particular people who were in charge of the cities, uh, like, like proconsul and so forth, were, were, were what it was in the first century, but not in the second and third century. So, so Ramsey became convinced then that uh, Luke was an accurate historian and was reporting on things in the first century uh, just like he said it would. And he eventually wrote some books, and one of them is called uh, Luke, uh, the Historian. Uh, and, and another uh, is, is written that convinces historically and archaeologically that uh, the cities Paul preached in, in, first, in uh, on his first missionary journey were the cities of Galatia that he wrote the Galatian epistle uh, to. And uh, uh, he also wrote a book entitled St. Paul, the Traveler and Roman Citizen. Uh, and uh, these, uh, F. F. Bruce in his commentary uh, quotes the words that I just uh, read. The leading part played by the women is in perfect accord with the manners of the country. In Athens or in an uh, Ionian city, it would be impossible. And that's a quote by F.F. F. Bruce from Ramsey. Luke consistently shows that it was the Jews who opposed Paul and his message and not the Romans. The Roman persecution came much, much later, uh, in about 64, 65, 66 AD. And we're still talking here on the missionary journey of being in the uh, 30s and 40s uh, AD. Uh, so uh, uh, it was not Roman persecution at this time. To put it uh, in the chronological order in the Bible, it was Jewish persecution, the same people who crucified Jesus, who were the ones who were persecuting the church and keeping, trying to keep the church from spreading uh, uh, in, in the uh, book of Acts and in the epistles. And it was not until you get to uh, the book of Revelation uh, and uh, uh, that you find it's the Romans who are doing the persecuting. And then beyond that, as the book of Revelation not only talks about at the time, but prophesies in, in, in the future. So uh, uh, keep that in mind. Don't do, Luke is even making a point that uh, Paul is there appealing to Caesar because he had to do that to keep from being murdered, assassinated by the Jews. And uh, the book indicates that 
they really had nothing to charge him with. Uh, and that's mentioned two or three times in connection with Paul's uh, appeal to Caesar. Uh, one of the judges, one of the, uh, not judges, one, one of the uh, uh, leaders, one of the kings, one of the people that he reported to in, in Acts, like Festus and Felix and Agrippa, uh, even made the statement, if he had not appealed to Caesar, uh, he would have been set free. Of course, the reality is, if he'd not appealed to Caesar, he'd have been killed. But nevertheless, that indicates what I was just saying, that they really didn't have anything to charge him with when they uh, sent him to Caesar, and that's been mentioned uh, uh, a number of times. In Acts 13, 51, 52 then, Barnabas and Paul and Barnabas shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Uh, they're converts, they're happy in spite of the persecution, and shook off the dust of their feet against them, a means that they were saying, uh, we don't have anything to do with you, we're just doing away with any hope that you would do anything right. And uh, it was a figure of speech in that day, Luke 9, uh, 5, and Luke 10, 11. Uh, uses the same figure and sort of explains what it uh, what it means uh, and there in the context of Jesus sending out his uh, uh, his disciples uh, to preach throughout the area uh, in Acts fourteen one to seven, uh, which we'll now read, uh, we have uh, the uh, missionary journey people had come now to Iconium. Now in Iconium, they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they remained a long time uh, speaking boldly for the Lord who bore witness to the word of his grace granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Again, indicating that the purpose of the signs and wonders was indeed to uh, confirm the word. Uh, but the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. And when an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers, to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, to the surrounding country. And there they continued to preach the gospel. Uh, so it didn't work well at Iconium. Uh, they received some uh, converts. They received some uh, uh, good results. But uh, uh, they also stirred up uh, the same people that were against them in other cities and uh, drove them out of uh, Iconium. So then they went to Lystra and, uh, and Derby. Uh, this is a pattern that began in, back in Antioch of Pisidia and continued throughout Paul's missionary journeys, all of them, all the way into and through Europe. They preached in the synagogue. They convert several, both Jews and devout Gentiles. The unbelieving Jews incite the opposition against them, and Paul and his companions leave to escape being killed. But they go to the next city, and there the process is repeated itself, and that goes on and on from city to city uh, as they preached in each city and then had to go somewhere else to preach. In verse 2, uh, the unbelieving Jews in Greek is actually the disobedient Jews. Uh, think about that in comparison with John 3 and verse 36. Uh, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever does not obey, same word, the Son, shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains in him. The King James Version translates both words by believes. Versions from the American Standard Version on, properly distinguished, imperfect, uh, important point, uh, disbelief equals disobedience, and vice versa. You can see that very clearly uh, when the uh, uh, Jews had come to uh, the Promised Land after wandering in the wilderness, uh, after going through the wilderness, 
and uh, were ready to go in and send in spies, and they believed the, the discouraging spies who didn't believe it was uh, they could possibly conquer the land, and uh, therefore were uh, condemned to wander in the wilderness for 40 years until that whole generation had died. Uh, it was disbelief, because God told them they could take the land if they went in, but it was disobedience because they didn't go in after God said to go in. If I may make a parallel, Jesus says, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Now, that's a promise that involves a, a command. We're to be baptized in order to save, to be saved. There are people who will not obey that command. They refuse to be baptized. And as a result of that, it's proper to say they really didn't believe. Because they believed what Jesus said, they would have done what he said. So uh, in virtually every case uh, that it comes up, uh, the, uh, the matter of disobedience and the matter of unbelief are the same thing. The disobedience is a result of the an unbelief. Uh, Note then that God endorsed the work by granting signs and wonders to be done by their hand. And verse 7, and there they preached the gospel. They left just ahead of being stoned. Today, might we say, just ahead of lynching. And the further they went, the further they got from civilization and the protection of Roman law and order. Whatever else might be said about Paul and Barnabas, it must be said that they were brave men willing to risk their lives to preach Christ to those who needed to hear about him. That's sort of a quotation from uh, Barclay's uh, commentary on, uh, on that part of, of Acts. Then we come to Lystra. Let's read Acts 14, verses 8 to 18. Uh, Now, in Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking, and Paul, looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voice, saying to, in Lyconium, The gods have come down in the likeness of men. And Barnabas they call Zeus, and Paul Hermes, or Mercury, we don't know to say, because he was the uh, uh, spokesman uh, for uh, the, the group. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was in the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates, and wanted to sacrifice uh, with the crowds. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd, saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news that you should uh, turn from these vain things, that's the idols they worshipped, to a living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that's in them. In past generations, God allowed all the, the, the nations to walk in their own ways. Yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and good gladness. And when the word they spoke, when these words scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. Uh, that's a sort of a shortened version of what Paul preached when he was preaching to Gentiles. There's a longer version of the same sermon uh, in uh, Acts 17, where he preaches to the uh, Athenian uh, philosophers there, uh, Stoics and, and Epicureans. Uh, when Paul preached to Jews, he talks about the scriptures and the scriptures that Jesus fulfilled showing he was the Messiah. That would not be relevant to the Gentiles. They didn't know the scriptures. They had never heard the scriptures. 
and uh, would not understand what was being said about them. But they did understand this reasoning, that there is one God, that he made everything. It's impossible to explain where everything came from uh, if, he, if you do not believe that he made everything. Uh, something cannot come from nothing, and life cannot come from non-life. And, and those are scientific facts that uh, uh, must be gotten around somehow if you're not going to believe in God, who is the life uh, who uh, established uh, non-life and brought it uh, into being. Uh, this uh, he healing caused them to think it was Barnabas and Saul uh, that were Zeus and Mercury. Uh, it's just an interesting coincidence, or maybe a providence, that when I was a kid, I had a book of mythology. Uh, and in that book of mythology, there was a, a story of Zeus and Barnabas uh, coming down to earth and, and interacting with people. According to the story, they went through a city, and in that city they were rejected and laughed at, and uh, so they left that city and went on up on the hill uh, to where they found uh, an elderly couple. And they talked with them, and the couple received them and fed them and did good things to them. And so they said, we wanted to bless you. Tell us what we can do. And they said, we would like to die at the same time so that neither one of us would have to live without the other. And the gods, Barnabas and the gods, uh, Zeus and uh, uh, Mercury, according to the story, said he would grant their wish. And they turned them into giant oak trees uh, up there on the hill. And the city below, they turned into a lake, and the people there who had rejected them were turned into fishes. Now, that's a mythology story. It did not happen. But it's interesting that that story was around, and therefore it was understandable that they would decide that it was Zeus and Mercury, or Zeus and Hermes, that were there now among them, because they already believed that those particular gods had uh, uh, come to earth and, uh, and, and, and had dealt with people on that occasion. Uh, here, the leading, leading man and the one in Acts 3 uh, were both told to arise and walk, and by the, in the name of Jesus Christ and by the power of Jesus, uh, as the apostles brought it to them, they uh, did walk. Uh, a little bit later, Peter's shadow uh, healed, after 5, verse 12. And so did Paul's handkerchiefs or aprons, in chapter 19, verse 12. Peter cast out demons, chapter 5, verse 16. And so did Paul, chapter 16, 18. Peter had an encounter with a sorcerer, Simon, and so did Paul with Elymas. And Peter raised the dead, Dorcas, and so did Paul, uh, Eutychus, who fell asleep at his preaching. I mention that just to say that uh, there possibly was a, a particular emphasis by Luke here to show that Paul and Barnabas were, that Peter and, and, and Paul were, uh, did similar things, and uh, their mission ministry uh, accomplished the same kind of things. F.F. Uh, Bruce points this out in his commentary. In verse 9, Paul, seeing that he had faith to be made well, looked at this man. Uh, that's sometimes noted and sometimes not required. Most frequently, instead of requiring faith on the part of the person being healed, you know that today uh, so-called modern faith healers, uh, when they explain their uh, failures, by saying, well, he didn't have faith. But it's fairly rare, rare in the uh, Bible for faith to be demanded by the one being healed. On the contrary, it's usually the one working the miracle who has to have the faith. For example, in uh, Matthew 17 and 18 to 20, when the Jews rebuked uh, him and the demon came out of him and the boy was healed instantly, 
Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast him out? And Jesus said to them, Because of your little faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, that's the smallest seed about that there is, you will say to this mountain, Move from here, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. So Jesus is saying the apostles lacked faith as a reason the miracle could not be done, rather than that the uh, person who uh, was being, had the miracle was being worked on uh, was, was lacking faith. And uh, uh, that uh, uh, contradicts a great deal of what uh, faith healers today now uh, say. This shortened version of the uh, Sermon to the Gentiles is to be compared, I mentioned this a while ago, with Acts 17 for a fuller version of, of what he did. They're still using the, uh, still be, u- using the scriptures from the Old Testament as he does when he preaches to Jews. He uses logic and reasoning uh, to say that uh, there is one God and he created all things and uh, in him we live and move and have our very being. Uh, Paul even quoted uh, Greek poets to that uh, effect as as well. Uh, In verse 15, Paul says these vain things, that's the uh, idols, versus a living God. Uh, Zeus and Hermes are empty nothings. God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, alone truly lives, who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. Uh, Paul proclaims an unknown God in Acts 17 that the people had talked about for themselves and say, I want to proclaim to you this unknown God. In preaching to the Jews who believe this Bible, he started with the Old Testament prophecies and reason to Jesus as the Christ. In preaching to pagans, he started with what they could see of nature and the world and reason to the maker of all. He started with the here and now to get to the there and then, again quoting Barclay's commentary. Thank you for being with us today. We'll take up uh, uh, next week with the, uh, uh, after the first missionary journey and the things that happened then. And we invite you to be with us uh, next Sunday morning uh, as we look at that. Thank you very much for being with us today.